podcast. And it talks about a study where they compared a whole bunch of different breathing styles for the maximum positive effect on people. And the one that they arrived at, which was most effective in this study, was called, yes, do you know what it's called? It was called cyclical sighing. Now, I'm not saying I called it, but I am saying I've been doing the simultaneous sigh since before this academic literature came out about the benefits of sighing. Just saying, just saying, I made the sigh cool before it was cool. Is that how that works? Anyway, without further ado, the moment has come to kick up the pinnacle of, situ of civilization, the peak of recorded human history, of which we are a part. Kick it up just a notch, make it that much better. It is your favorite part of the day. The thing that makes everything better. And you know why. You know why. It is the world famous, scientifically backed, simultaneous sigh. All you have to do is take a deep breath in of this beautiful air we surround ourselves with. All you need is goodwill, good faith, good timing, bravery, courage, honor, conscientiousness, learned optimism, faith, any virtue will do. Take your pick. And take a deep breath in and let it out in synchrony with me. Three, two, one. Ah. Did you feel that? Somewhere out there in the world, a lost puppy was just found by the little girl who lost it. Incredible. Keep up the great work. <clears throat> now we got the scientific simultaneous sigh out of the way. This video is part of air this stream. I don't like how YouTube started to separate videos and live streams on the channel page. They all just used to be in videos and now there's videos and live streams, so make sure you look out for that. But the place you should look the most is the After Socrates playlist. So you go on Mindful Before Meaning, over to Playlist, After Socrates Companion. This video is a part of that series, and they're meant to be viewed in order. So if you haven't seen the first few videos, what are we up to now, five? Go there, watch them in sequence. <sighs> so today I'm going to guide through a little bit of a meditation here and then and then I will <clears throat> actually just cut this a little bit short today because I want to watch more of, I want to use my time to watch more of episode two, the actual, actual After Socrates lecture series by John Rebecca. So, <clears throat> let's get in our meditation posture. So I'm not going to take my slippers off. <clears throat> Sit on something. 
I used to meditate just flat on the ground, but as John explained to me, um, you need your rear end elevated up above your legs just a little bit in order to have the right posture in your back. And you want to be comfortable so you can focus on being in the present moment. So get in your meditation position, seated in a chair with your feet flat on the ground is fine. On a meditation cushion, on some kind of cushion. Meditation stool is nice. <sighs> Do any of you burn incense or light a candle or play music when you meditate? That could work too. Incense is nice because Scent is particularly good at setting yourself into a certain type of mental mode. It's strong for memory and associating mental states. I used to be a big fan of frankincense, and I haven't done it in a while. But I would have the frankincense resin and a little dish and actually these charcoal. Um, and I would put the, the resin right on the charcoal or off set above it on a little metal grate. And use that for my incense during my meditations. Normal stick incense is good. Whatever works for you. Beeswax candle. I would like, I like the, like, sort of natural resin incense rather than some kind of, like, chemical. So they make frankincense and other things in that kind of natural category. Little inset sticks. Pine is kind of nice. Anyway. <clears throat> Maybe I'll get pine tree incense. Do whatever scents you like. Essential oils, too. Just like a little essential oil aftershave on. Alright, enough about scents. We'll start rocking forward and back, forward and back, feeling our center, arriving at our center through our sense of it. Open up the chest, let the arms lay, relax, find your center from side to side, side to side, cross the center a little bit less each time, like you're a bowling pin that you almost knocked down. But it just boop, 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 pounced itself and became still, grounded into your head independently.
Relax your face. Relax your belly. Don't force the breath, but allow it. Be deep. Deep, naturally energizing breath. Thinking, return to the breath. I'm going to go into a deliberate breathing practice now, as recommended in that study I mentioned earlier. I will show you how it goes. It's one breath in, another breath, force air in. Uh, a long relaxed, exhale, so a breath in, another breath in, ah. a long, loud, relaxing exhale, breath in, exhale, I will keep doing that.
you want to keep meditating on your own for your own meditative practice go ahead and pause the video here and you can come back to the video I am going to I'm going to pull up after Socrates right here, like I did in the last stream. I wasn't anticipating I would want to do this. So bear with me. There it is. Let's see how this works. Sing. Going through the labor pains of giving birth to yourself. That is to be on the horizon of wonder. It is to be in a place in which you are calling yourself and your world into question, so a new self in a new world can deeply be born. Welcome back to episode two of After Socrates. Last time we looked at four ways we are after the way of Socrates, and we also reviewed the basic format of the series. Now let's continue being after Socrates. Right now at the beginning, as we orient ourselves to find our way, let's follow Socrates. And in order to follow Socrates, we have to understand how he understood himself. And this is going to be perplexing. Socrates' self-knowledge. He found himself and frequently described himself as atipos, not belonging to any particular category, like our word atypical, but deeper or powerful. He explicitly refers to himself sometimes, and Plato refer, has other characters refer to him in terms of monsters, as monstrous. He's like a satyr, he's like a stingray. He com compares himself to a titan, many different kinds of monsters. This is a recurring thing across many of the dialogue. Famously, he describes himself as metaxu, M-E-T-A-X-U, as fundamentally in between, in between the human and the divine. I'm going to come back to that because Socrates never thinks that he becomes anything other than a human being. So he says we, like him, at least he's challenging us to realize that we, like him, are somehow in between human finitude and the transcendence of the divine. Drew Highland, excellent book, and we'll come back to it, talks about finitude and transcendence in the Platonic Dialogues. Socrates does something really interesting when he says that he's metaxu. He says, so is Eros. Eros isn't a human, but it's a transhuman force. It's not a god. Eros is a daemon. D-A-E-M-O-N, not a demon, but a daemon, a being that is between and therefore mediates and unites the human and the divine. And just think about it. Isn't there something really insightful in that about love? So Socrates, he understands himself as fundamentally liminal, He's within and without. 
sort of fits our categories, but he doesn't. He's monstrous. The monster takes normal categories and distorts them in a way that is startling and challenging and disruptive. Somehow Socrates transcends our normal framing in a way that is challenging and even at times threatening. How is Socrates within and without? How is he liminal? How is he monstrous in a way that's constantly challenging and threatening to us, but nevertheless beneficial to us? And how does he do this while never claiming to be anything other than a mortal? A mortal, doomed to die human being. So Socrates enters into these intensive, in terms of how he's involved with people, but extensive in terms of how much scope they take in, how much they zoom in and zoom out, probative conversations with people. And in these conversations, questioning, not just questions, questioning. It's even better perhaps to hear a related word to questioning, questing. Questioning plays a central part rather than concluding. These exploratory dialogues are often centered on what is virtue? What is wisdom, related things? What is knowledge? What is goodness? What is real? And these are questions, and this is the importance. These are questions we cannot ignore. This is why we cannot ignore Socrates. We can't ignore these questions. We can pretend to ignore them, but then we're just giving answers to these questions given to us implicitly, unconsciously, automatic, uh, automatically, and we reactively acting them out rather than acting on principle. Yet, these dialogues frequently and frustratingly end profoundly inconclusively, inconclusively. Everybody, including, really hear that, including Socrates, they've been talking about courage. At the end of it, everybody says, I don't know what courage is, including Socrates. Socrates claims to have achieved human wisdom in that he, by practicing this kind of dialogue, has come to know that he does not know. And we go, what? That's it? We're all ignorant. I know. There's tons I don't know. Well, how is this? What's going on? Well, Socrates doesn't mean that generic belief. He, he means an existentially in the situation specific realization in both senses of the word. It's a palpable reality and one is coming to a deep understanding awareness of how one is ignorant in this situation in a way that matters because one has been pretending deeply, unconsciously, automatically reactive to know, know both the situation and no oneself relevant to and relative to that situation. This is a profound kind of realization. It requires disciplined mindfulness. He has cultivated and this is going to become an important, important phrase. He has learned learned ignorance. In fact, when I say learned ignorance, I want you to hear both pronunciations, learned and learned. He has learned ignorance. He has become, he has become aware of his ignorance 
in a way that makes a huge difference to specific, actual, concrete situations. So let's explore the dynamics of this a little bit better. So we have, on one pole, we have conversation. Socrates is engaging in a conversation. I want you to start to get a feel for this. I want you to think of those conversations you've been in, where you're asking each other questions, and you're not giving sort of pat answers. You're really opening up. The person's opening up, and you're opening up. You're reciprocally opening. And the conversation starts to take on a life of its own. And, and, and it's not wandering aimlessly. It's wandering fruitfully. And you, you both find you're getting to places and having insights, realizations that you couldn't have had on your own. When the conversation comes to an end, you say, that was one of the greatest moments of my life. Socrates is like that. Okay. I think I'm going to stop right there for now. Please do, if you're following along, please do watch the video on your own. Engage in your practices in your own way. And I will see you next time. Thanks for joining.